Yeah, unfortunately, I have one question for no, a question and comment for Baron Cohen. Oh. Since he's not here, I will not. I pro presumably will not ask it or not comment. But uh, I, I, just to uh, just to say that, in addition to genes and uh, environmental inputs into uh, into this type of trait, it is very likely that there would be also transgenerational epigenetic inputs, because we find them in in other in other cases uh, of uh, when, when this thing has been sought. But my other question is for one who is here, and this is uh, <laughs> to, Dr. Uh, to the last speaker. And my question is about the difference between metacognition and meta-representation. It is not clear to me that these are the same things. Uh, if I'm thinking about all the models that I know from neuroscience about uh, how uh, all, all models of consciousness, for example, uh, Damasio's mod uh, models of consciousness, or Edelman's, anybody. Everybody assumes that there is mapping and mapping of mapping and probably several mappings of mappings. So, the, the, so that there are meta-representations whether or not you are talking about a human being which is fully aware of its thoughts or you're talking at very, very simple kind of uh, conscious states such as just feeling hunger or feeling pain and things like that. So it is not clear to me why you are confounding these two things and why is it that a mapping of a mapping is a way of the brain thinking about them itself. It seems to me like you are mixing metaphors. Mm. Um, yeah, I didn't have time to uh, get into that important uh, question. I don't think I'm mixing them up, uh, but there's an important difference between a redescription of which the, you know, there's indeed many, many instances in the brain. And if you take any simple connectionist network, or any feed-forward pathway in the brain, indeed you can think of uh, each layer as redescribing and so meta-representing, in a sense, uh, the information that's on the, on the layers below. Um, that doesn't count as a meta-representation, in a sense. Uh, it's, it's a mere redescription. Um, and I'm still trying to sort out, and we ran into this uh, instantiating or implementing the models that, uh, that I've described. One important thing is um, for the redescription to be somehow independent from the first order causal chain. Yeah? So these redescriptions, when they play a meta representational role, need to be not embedded in a first order causal chain, like it would be the case for one particular layer in the visual system or one particular area in the visual system or one particular layer in a long chain of uh, you know, layers in a connectionist network, but to sit outside of that chain so that it can redescribe what the first order chain does independently of what it, what it does, basically. And then it can begin to play a meta-representational role, but I think there's also a sort of continuum between simple meta-representations and more complex meta-representations, including all the way to a personal level metacognition that uh, characterizes uh, some aspects at least of our uh, waking life or conscious life um, and, and, and forms of representations that correspond in that sense to Rosenthal's idea of higher order thoughts uh, which are themselves assumed to be unconscious. Yeah? So, so I think there's a continuum between redescription and uh, genuine meta-representation both in terms of there being subpersonal all the way to personal level and also in terms of how independent they are uh, with respect to whatever the first order we described chain uh, is actually doing. Okay, so I'll ask the question here, please. Um, hi, Robin Zabrowski from Beloit College. Uh, my question is for M Martha. Um, so I want to probably start by saying that you, I agree with your conclusion about the, the animal behaviors that we want to probably attribute to them something like what we imagine they're experiencing, um, but you also say it's an empirical question and when we, when we have other data we ought to pay attention to that. So I'm wondering about the, the data um, on human neonate imitation. So for example, the fact that an hour old baby will imitate the facial expressions of the doctor, uh, sticking out his tongue, the baby will stick out his tongue as well. Um, and so it seems as though the, the claim about the, the, the horses dancing or whatever it was, the, that, that they must have an analogy from their body to the body of the teacher. Um, babies, I don't think, have that analogy from body to body. I think there's something much more 
un much less cognitive going on in that case. So I wonder if that neonate imitation stuff problematizes the claims you're making. There's, there's quite a large um, uh, amount of stuff written on imitation, as you probably know. <clears throat> um, the, the, I, I think what has probably happened in the case where we are using it is that the animal has learned that if I lift my leg, he lifts his leg. Um, so it's a stimulus response. But on the other hand, he does that much more frequently than shaking his head or wagging his tail or something. So all of which we've also taught. So it indicates that he's got some awareness that it's his leg is lifting rather than his head is lifting. And we have measured all this, and it is significantly higher. Um, the other imitation thing which was, was rather took me by the surprise is the, the picture I showed you where the three horses were imitating, and one was the foal. Now, the foal had never learned to do anything of that nature, but the other two had, and they were doing it because I was doing it. But the interesting thing was the foal did it too. And that really took me by surprise. And one of the things about imitation is that if it's a novel act, then it is probably something that they are actually really imitating. But yes, I mean, there may be well a fair amount of that. But the other very interesting thing about this was <clears throat> to do with um, uh, mirror neurons and all that debate is that we looked at whether or not in our um, communication of one animal with another, to what extent they did the same action back. Now, there are obviously some that inevitably they will do the same action back, that if you're tusking each other, you're both tusking. So those were eliminated. But things like when you were shaking your head or throwing your trunk about or putting your ears back or whatever. Um, do you do the same thing back and what percentage were? And we had phenomenally um, significant, uh, uh, for about 10 or 15 behaviors, they did the same thing as they received. Now, why? Um, and one can't help thinking, well, maybe there is something, whether it's a conscious thing or not, I've no idea, okay. but there is something going on there about doing the same thing back. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, on my right, please. Hi, uh, Matthew Garthaus, Luxembourg mm -hmm. University. Uh, this is for Dr. Uh, Baron Cohen, mostly, I guess. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. This was really specific, so I'll just. Uh... Oh, all right. Thank you anyway. We can try to answer. Well, um, uh, yeah, you you can always post it to the blog, or or also use Facebook or no, no Facebook, no Facebook at all. <laughs> you see. <laughs> okay. So um, uh, I forgot to say it earlier, but if you if you have questions uh, one to another here, um, uh, feel free to do so. Okay. Well, so uh, if not, you on my right, please. I have a question for uh, Mars. Uh, you said that we can assume that uh, horses and other mammals are conscious because they behave like they're conscious. And I was wondering if, for example, I bowl a robot who is who behaves uh, exactly like a human or like a horse, can we give it also the benefits of the doubt and assume that it is conscious? Well, I'm, I'm so confused about consciousness after 10 days of it that um, I really don't know. I mean, all I'm saying is that if you're saying that humans are conscious in those senses, then I think we have to say that these other mammals are too in those senses. I'm not suggesting they're metacognitive planning for making robots or whatever, but until we have evidence the contrary, I would suggest that we have to go along with that so far. But whether anything is conscious of anything, I'm now beginning to wonder. Except for me, I do know that I am aware and I'm feeling. Exactly. So back to old Descartes. 
Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, Felix, Merci Montréal. I have a question for uh, Professor Alfred Mel about the Libet experiment. So my question might seem uh, a bit naive because uh, I don't know much about this kind of experiment, but I'm wondering if uh, someone uh, uh, has ever uh, uh, attempted to uh, see if there's a way to, uh, to, uh, to uh, what, see what's happening in the EEG signal at the time where uh, the, the, the person reports, uh, not when she, the person reports uh, that she has made a decision, but at the time, anyways, you see what I mean? When she thought that she made the decision. Oh, sure. What happens to EG at that time? Yeah. Is there somehow something to see? Let's see if this is working. Is it working? Sounds yes. like it. Yeah. So the reports, of course, are made after the wrist flexes. Yeah. And the average time of first reported awareness is about 200 milliseconds before the muscle burst. Mm -hmm. And remember, the uh, computer is triggered to make a record of the preceding second of brain activity by the muscle burst. So you can see what's going on at 200 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, is there a, a pen here? I can just yeah. draw it. Now, remember, you have to average over 40 trials. So this, yeah. this is an average thing. Yeah. Um, so this will be zero. And this is minus 550 milliseconds. I can't draw it all, but it looks something like this. Uh, starts off like this, and it ramps up like that, and 200 is about here. So, you know, you're, you're getting a ramp up. Yeah, but uh, you know it's uh, it's EG. So how do you know, how can we know if there's a, co a component uh, at the minus 250? So we say that the, the we say that the, the we say that the RP the radiance potential is beginning at, at uh, minus 550, yeah. and then we infer that since it's uh, it's growing at a kind of bit linear. I don't know if it's linear. It's, it's hard to see like that. But we kind of infer that there's no component at minus 250, which is uh, we, there's no way to know in an EG if that's true. Yeah, no, exactly right. So, so that might you don't know if something very special is happening right here. Or not. Exactly. So the special thing seems to be the ramp up, and then uh, Libet said, well, that must be where the decision is made. But there are all kinds of problems with that. Um, you know, if I'm watching you do something, and I know what you're about to do, so if, for example, a, a red light is flashed, you're supposed to move your left hand, or uh, a green light is flashed, you're supposed to move your right hand, and I know that, and I know when you're going to do it, and they're taking EEG from me, and we do it 40 times or so, we get a signal that looks sort of like this. Uh, what that indicates really is that this is representing something like motor imagery, could be motor preparation. It's something pretty generic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a mistake to think it's representing your own decision. Yeah, so there might be two different components, one for the decision, one for the, the butter uh, thing. Anyways. Yeah, and you might not be able to pick it up. If you, in fact, you know, it looks like you can't. Um, People use fMRI, but it's much slower. There's a group that's, that has uh, access to epilepsy patients, so they have open skulls for diagnostic purposes. They use electrode grids. Uh, they get better readings, and after a while, they can get single trial readings, too. Um, but even then, there doesn't look like there's any magic at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is more of a, a request for the panelists to discuss how they place consciousness in a particular scenario. Um, and the scenario is uh, practice by experts. Um, and what I mean by practice is take the example of a, a musician, where a musician is practicing something and critically listening to what they're doing and adapting then the way that they're functioning, but they're using behaviors that are highly trained, partially in deeply encoded, so partially subconscious, because there's no way they'd do all of that consciously, while still addressing and manipulating their processes at an expert level, which is sort of with a sensitivity beyond that of a, an amateur. Um, so where in that process of self-study and control and adaptation is consciousness active in your sort of respective ideas about this? Um. I don't really know. Uh, what, I, what I get from your question is that, and this is well known in expertise, uh, expertise involves chunking. This is an idea that we owe to uh, uh, New Orleans Simon back then, uh, basically. 
And so I think that when you learn any sort of complex behavior, most of which uh, involves sequential actions, uh, what happens is that some bits of it gets compiled at some point, so to speak. Uh, they become automatic. And then the focus of what it is that you're intentionally learning in these uh, cases can shift towards learning the organization of successive bits of the, uh, of the overall behavior. Uh, so if you learn a complex athletic skill, maybe you'll practice up until the point of automatization some components of the movements that are required to execute uh, the entire, I don't know, uh, dance for instance, or a uh, complex series of movements required to, to perform athletics uh, and so on and so forth. Likewise for learning to play the piano or something like that. So I think that you know, you sort of shift towards higher and higher levels of uh, conscious organization. We're, we're trying to look at this in, uh, in an experiment now that replicates uh, Zybo's 1963 uh, task, which was the basis to document the uh, power law of learning. Uh, and that involves a 1,023 choice reaction time task. Um, and the way you get to 1,023 is by having people see up to 10 lights come up on the screen at the same time, and they have to press on one of ten, or one, on each of 10 corresponding keys. Yeah. So the, the, they end up producing chords. So the skill involves mastering uh, complex uh, key, series of key presses, uh, and you get to 1,023 by having two to the power of 10 minus one, the case where there's no stimulus. Yeah. And so it takes up to a month for people to master this, and they go from a sort of beginning uh, situation where it takes them about one hour and a half to complete a thousand trials, the, the 1,023 trials, and, and their movements are completely sequential at that point, yeah? So they press each finger in sequence, sometimes they, they, get, they get it wrong, so they have to lift that particular finger again, and it's difficult, and so on and so forth. At the end of that month, they can do this in 20 minutes, and it's all, you know, completely automatized uh, parallel sequences of movements. So as they learn the skill, the focus of their expert attention, so to speak, uh, goes from programming these individual move movements to uh, programming entire, you know, sub packets of movements or chunks of movements and so on and so forth. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Uh, um, so what is the status of what it is they're doing at that point? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a mixture between portions of uh, aspects of the uh, behavior that are automa automatic mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the involvement of conscious attention then and conscious monitoring in combining these uh, automatized uh, chunks. Well, but what you've described sounds like just a very slow machine learning process. Yeah, and? So that doesn't include consciousness. And? So that doesn't necessarily include a conscious process. I think one reason why I'm interested in looking at, for example, a, da a dancer's movement is in the process of learning and chunking these particular uh, motions, say, there's then an opening for more access to control over what's going on and a sensitivity that is growing out of that that then allows for a whole range of other possibilities that aren't accessible prior to developing those, those chunks. Okay. But that only comes with the sensory feedback and, and the, the paying attention to the okay. process within um, the growing expert. All right. Again, I'm I, not sure. I, I don't know no, how no, that again, task would sure, but come into that. that. Uh, one, one state that I find particularly interesting is this uh, flow state, yeah? uh, that true experts at uh, doing something report, where the subjective experience is one of observing yourself carrying out the behavior. And that I take to be truly, completely automatic, <laughs> genuinely expert uh, behavior, up to the point that the behavior has become so adapted and so automatic that it can actually be carried out entirely of its own with you watching yourself performing the behavior as an observer, which of course then completely frees you up to, uh, well, begin mentalizing about what's going on and imagining um, other variations and so on and so forth. So, um, that's all I can say about it. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so consciousness not related? Consciousness not really? <laughs> well, I don't know. It's a mixture. I think it's a mistake to think that you're either conscious or not of something. Any complex behavior is going to have both 
automatic components and uh, sort of conscious components is going to have contributions from conscious and unconscious processes. Yeah? And I think these are examples of that. I have a quick question. How much do you pay your subjects? <laughs> How long is it? One month or two months? Well, they, uh, they did it for 500 euros, and may, many of them were couples. So, um, you know, they get a nice small weekend in Italy or something for that. If, if you do it for a thousand, I'll fly to Belgium. Yeah, oh, really? <laughs> You're that cheap? <laughs> well, um, as a very simple minded ethologist, I think you're talking about habits, aren't you? Um, and it's, this is rather important in my line of business to establish the right habits and then see if they will continue thereon so that you can teach a more complex thing on top of that, which is what playing your instruments are. If, however, your middle C isn't operative, although you may have a very automatic, uh, it, you've learnt it consciously, but it's become something that subconscious, unconscious, whatever you will, in how you play that piece, so that your attention can be on all the musicality and whether you do this and that and the other and do it louder or softer or whatever, which is where your attention is and your consciousness is. If, however, your middle C doesn't function, suddenly you come back to thinking, oh gosh, now where do I put my next fingers? So it seems to me that there's a kind of switch with habits between conscious and unconsciousness because they were originally learnt by some sort of attention and consciousness. But I think I'm just saying the same thing, but rather in simple words. I don't know. Okay, no question, please. A uh, question for uh, Axel Clearance. Um The different scales that you use to, uh, for the for the subjects to report their uh, impressions on the visual stimuli. Um, yes. I want to know what exactly, well, I, I'm not, I have a problem with these scales, like what's a glimpse? Does a glimpse mean I saw it for a very little amount of time? Was, does it mean that there were less features that I expected to be? Does it, how, how degraded is this stimuli? Or is it, a, is it that it's not degraded but it's simple? And uh, if you take that with the post-wagering um, uh, questions, it seems that it bundles all of these things together. So maybe I'm sure that I saw a certain feature, but I'm not sure about the other features. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. This came up in a tutorial that uh, I gave at ASSC 16 with uh, Morton Overgaard and other people who've been involved in these uh, scale comparisons. Um, and so one good point is that this perceptual awareness scale uh, doesn't tell you anything about the contents. Uh, it just asks people to report whether they saw, that, whether they had a visual impression. Yeah? Um, and so the point you're making holds. Uh, but it also has theoretical implications. So if you take Sid Quidder's, for instance, uh, partial awareness hypothesis, that's a specific hypothesis about how we can get gradedness out of all or non contents or, or, or all or non elements in a sense, yes? So you can have partial awareness of a word, for instance, not because you see everything at 50%, so to speak, but because you have perceived two or three letters of the words and so you, and, and completely, and so you have the sort of, you know, you cannot say what the word is, uh, but you have seen something, so you would say, I had a brief glimpse or I had an almost clear experience. Now, these scales are indeed. I wouldn't say they're problematic, uh, but it's a challenge to use them. Um, they're also required because we get things out of them that you don't get out of binary measures such as yes-no judgments and so on and so forth. And over the past few years, we've looked into these skills in, in, in some detail and comparing them is very interesting because it, it helps us understand um, how to characterize people's experiences in these uh, visual situations, for instance, with a little bit more of, uh, precision and acknowledging the fact that uh, some of these contents can be graded. So it's an ongoing work. Uh, we have one paper that compared those three scales. There's now another that just appeared, I think, in consciousness and cognition, comparing different scales in a completely different domain that has nothing to do with visual perception. This is artificial grammar learning with the same sort of reasoning. Let's see what happens when we uh, compare these different scales. Um, and what's interesting to me, minimally, is that you get different results out of the different scales. 
uh, which is crucial because, for instance, uh, some, someone like De Haan, who argues that consciousness is all or none, at some point in the Sergent and De Haan uh, paper on the attentional blink, used a fully continuous scale with 100 steps um, precisely to point out that even when you give people the opportunity to express these completely graded judgments, they still report binary awareness. However, we just found that uh, using that skill, people are unhappy, in fact, reporting 72% of uh, awareness in one case and 58 in another. Instead, they just move that cursor to the extremes of, this, uh, of the scale, and they, they, they say themselves they would rather use three or four point scales like Overgaard has, uh, has developed. Now, he developed that particular scale in collaboration with uh, the participants, in fact, uh, some years ago. So he told people, you have to indicate to me what the different degrees of your conscious experience in this situation are. And so some people ended up using seven points, others used five, six, and so on and so forth. And so he sort of worked with everybody, <laughs> and they, they ended up converging on this four, sometimes three point scale, basically. Um, so yes, there's challenges involved, but I think these are interesting challenges because they inform the theory. You know? Thank you. Uh, hi. I have a comment and a question for Mark. Um, first, I just want to say I'm very grateful for what you've uh, brought to us today. Um, I was very uh, uh, moved and interested by, by all of this, and um, I really like your stance about uh, the way we treat animals and conceive their well-being and such. Uh, if we have no absolute proof that it is otherwise, we, we're better off. We know it's a better bet considering that they are feeling conscious creatures in, in, in different ways. Uh, I think the logic is implacable, but as we've been discussing at some point here, uh, humans are not hyper-rational animals, so I think people are just kind of consciously or unconsciously uh, in denial of the possible very bad effects that they're having on animals and they're just carrying out uh, sadly but truly anyways uh, and my question is actually about uh, consciousness hey um, you you said at some point if I'm correct you said that habits are adaptive because you know the ability to uh, learn and do uh, habitual I mean, uh, actions that are that have become a habit free the consciousness for another purpose and that's how they are adaptive did you say did you say it like that that's the general idea yes because once it becomes a habit and you no longer have to pay attention to it because it's like driving a motor car or riding a bicycle or any of those things you don't have to think exactly how you're doing everything about it but you did when you learned if you didn't put the brake on just like that or you kept the, you know, you yeah. fell off with a great bump. So when you were learning, you had to pay attention to all that stuff. But once it had become a habit, then you no longer have to pay that much attention to it, which allows you to free your attention for other stuff. So if you happen to be a, um, I don't know, a, 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 an elephant wandering around and um, uh, you you feel vaguely thirsty. You don't have to think, now if I go left at this tree, I'll go right at that one and eventually I'll end up at the water. It's kind of a fairly habitual track to get there. And I think that's why perhaps we've got so muddled up with conscious and unconscious stuff with animals because it's also very often believed that once it's conditioned, then it uh, doesn't require any thought anymore. And most people believe this when they're training. And, oh, well, it's conditioned, isn't it? Ha ha. He's going to do it automatically. I programmed the machine. Yeah, like yeah. a machine. But of course, he does until such things go wrong. I mean, one example I have is when um, just walking requires a whole lot of stuff. You know, you've got to do this, that, and the other. Now, both me and my filly hurt our legs. I, and we had to limp to get to A to B. So that brought back to uh, one's attention how one was walking, because how could she move that back leg without it causing enormous amount of pain? If she did it the habitual way, it didn't work. 
So eventually she had to learn to hop. So basically you're, you're taking for granted that consciousness is highly linked to learning and if, uh, I don't know if my logic is impeccable on this, but if, if the, the, the adaptive function of habits are to be able to free the consciousness for something else, so it would assume that conscience has a, an, a, a very uh, adaptive function which is tied to learning but could also be something else. Well, I think that, but I'm not sure that I could defend it in this environment. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, attention and consciousness and awareness, I'm tending to use rather as one kind of thing. It's that you are, you're doing, you are somehow aware of doing what you're doing, and that's useful to you in that set of circumstances. But it equally can be put into another drawer. Merci. Hi, I'm Juliette, University of Montréal. My question is for Dr. Clearman. Um, I was very interested in the model you present. One reason for that is um, I'm also interested in yoga. And um, it, it seemed to me that um, your model reminded me of um, the yoga way of seeing the, the self as the true self which is able to watch uh, the thoughts. And um, they also say that when you put yourself in a meditation practice, you um, actually practice being in your true self. And uh, that by doing this practice, you actually develop your true self and allows it to be present more in your everyday life and actions. And um, if you accept this relationship between the two views, Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on what the actual um, effect of the meditation practice would be on the um, model of um, the nodes that, of interaction that you described, the first order and second order. Would meditation then be a um, practice that allows reinforcement or um, more uh, the, the, the higher order level nodes to become more present in some way? Um, these are really good questions and I'm interested in these issues, but uh, I haven't given them a lot of thought. It seemed to me that uh, in meditation and perhaps also hypnosis, uh, the idea is to make the self disappear in a sense. Yeah? So you're reducing metacognition in a way. Um, is that not the case? I mean, uh, Zoltan Dienesh, for instance, in the case of hypnosis, has defended the idea that uh, it involves hot, uh, cold control, in a sense, yeah? Uh, so I, a removal of high order thoughts, in a sense, yeah? Um, well, yeah, well, I don't know about hypnosis at all, but uh, in meditation, uh, you removal of thoughts, but at the same time, that would put yourself more into consciousness. Perhaps by focusing consciousness more on the sensory uh, contents as opposed to, you know, sort of ongoing narrative commentary about what's going on, which seems to characterize a lot of uh, a lot of people's, you know, day-to-day -day cognitions. Um, so you focus on experience per se, basically, which is not something that we that we do, and certainly not something that we do consciously very often. Well, the um, way I'm, uh, okay, I'm sorry to intervene, but uh, no, that's just I don't know if the if you both have the same notion of consciousness here. Uh, you know, the kind of consciousness is talking about seems to me a bit different from your point of view. I'm not surprised everybody has his own idea of consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. But if yeah, you, if I don't further your yeah. question, maybe you have better ideas in meditation. Okay. Sorry, what were you saying? What were you just saying now? Um, was I saying something? <laughs> <laughs> See? It's a, there was a very funny moment at the Oh, yeah, you were talking there. about focusing on sensory experience. I'm, I'm not an expert, so I, but my impression is that that's one step in meditation, but you can reach another step where there is just, you don't, you f basically focus on your pure awareness, and I think someone else mentioned that today. So then, you know, what's going on in terms of all your nodes and... 
Yes. Uh, I, I really couldn't comment on that. I, I just, um, right. I'm not enough of a, uh, not, uh, I'm not knowledgeable enough about uh, meditation. And I think also the problem here is that obviously, as you know, there's no one meditation. I mean, it's a no, series of, of practices that are different. very diverse and depending on the tradition. So, you know, so I think this, this it would be a very dis difficult discussion here if we don't, don't, you know, are not very precise about exactly what the meditation practice is and because meditation is not one thing. Is well, there are many practices, but I think there is, well, my, my feeling at least is that there is like some sort of consensus over what the effect is. I, I'm not so sure, but maybe we can talk about that later. Now. Thank you. But okay. isn't this something to do with the mind blanking stuff we heard yesterday, yeah. um, and which I'm very confused about? I mean, is that, is that meditation? Uh, I, I believe so. I believe meditation is focusing on that blinking, yeah. Thank you. For present, please. Yeah, this is a question for Axel Clearmans. And it's about the Rosenthal higher order theory. Um, and I don't really know the theory, so, um, but I was listening to your description of it and scratching my head. So the problem might just be that I'm not Maybe getting it. Um, so here's what I'm thinking. So suppose I go into psychotherapy and uh, after a while the therapist says, you know, your problem is that you hate your mother and you believe that she's evil. And I go, no, I love my mother and I think she's good. And then he starts arguing with me and he eventually convinces me. So now I believe that I hate my mother and I believe that she's, I believe that I believe that she's evil. And I might even know those things if I'm really well justified. And so now it seems to follow on Rosenthal's theory that those states are conscious, but it seems like we should say, no, they're not. So <clears throat> it seems like he's, the theory seems to me to be confusing the difference between being conscious of a state and the state being conscious. Um, or am I missing something? Well, that's precisely what he says. It's, he says that a state is a conscious state when one is conscious of being in that state. So, 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 he, so my hatred of my mother is now conscious as soon as he convinces me that I hate her? It's a conscious state? It may not be a true state, but, but it's a conscious state. But maybe state. it is true. It seems it like I sub... It doesn't have to be true. <laughs> it seems like I unconsciously hate her and I know that I unconsciously hate her. It's no, but wait. I mean, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know your mother, so... <laughs> Um, suggestion, for instance, works all the way down to the details of what happens in a Stroop situation, for instance. So you can have false beliefs that are causally effective. Uh, you, can have, um, you can have misperceptions. You can think that this uh, dog uh, is, a, is a wolf, whereas in fact it's a dog, and so on and so forth. So, so I don't see, I mean, higher order thoughts uh, do not need to be veridical uh, no, in a but, sense. But, yeah? Sir, so, let's just assume that I'm right. Assume that I really do hate her and I believe that I hate her, but I don't feel the hatred. Well, then you suffer from, uh, what is it called again? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's called unconsciously <laughs> hating, right? <laughs> you, then you, you would suffer from Kabla syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, High order thoughts can shape your perceptions, well, uh, but but not be true. Uh, that's in, in, you might you might even argue that that, that is uh, the mechanism for false belief. That is the mechanism for some certain classes of illusions, and so on and so forth. So, well, let's talk about it some more. Okay, <laughs> okay. Oh, this side, please. Uh, okay, I want to go with. There's a question somewhat earlier about expert performance, uh, and possibly need to make a distinction between an expert as they practice and as they perform. Uh, so there is, uh, I think it was Hubert Dreyfus came up with a scale of levels of uh, performance, which he probably copied from Plato. Uh, but I'll give a couple of anecdotes and then make, the, make a comment that I'm addressing to the whole panel. Uh, one anecdote is back in the mid-70s when I was a sessional instructor at University of Alberta, and one of the graduate students in the department I was in was the Canadian fencing champion. And I asked him one, once, well, when you're fencing, 
you know, how do you, how do you decide what to do? And he said, well, I don't think about it at all. I'm not thinking. Uh, it just feels like I should move one way or move another way or so forth. And then a number of years later, I got basically the same story from a friend of mine in San Francisco who's a very accomplished martial artist. Uh, and connecting this with these different scales of expertise, and I think you said, you know, at, at a certain point, it's no longer, the person is no longer thinking about what they're doing, it's simply happening, and their mind is observing. And, and then I think you made a, made a mistake in saying it's, it's, so it's free to think about this or that or the other thing, and I would say no, it has to be observing only because there are always fluctuations that occur. And so that observing serves the function of there's a fluctuation, rapid adjustment, uh, like that. And it's, if there's a break in that, you know, and the person thinks about, you know, a thought occurs, uh, then suddenly they're done. That's the end of it. Uh, so yeah, I feel like to throw that out. Yeah, in a way, that's sort of um, attentive observing is what's involved in meditation. Uh, yeah, I, that, that, I was that's interested least, in that you know, so question about meditation some, some, as some well. Some meditators to describe that the state of being, uh, uh, being in that state. Um, yes, probably. I mean, there's, there's this phenomenon of choking under pressure in a way, uh, or of paying too much conscious attention to what it is that you're executing that is actually detrimental to the, uh, to the execution. So as yourself, you, you have to remove yourself uh, from the loop, basically, and let, let the behavior uh, flow. I think that these examples that you point, um, and this was raised earlier as well, I think, uh, are also an indication that consciousness takes time and that action can be so habitual, so adapted, that it actually takes place, and there's lots of good evidence for that, before you realize that the behavior is taking place. And that is what one means by expertise. Just your fencing expert uh, fences faster than he can think about it, uh, and faster than he can become aware of what it is that you're, that, that, that you're actually doing. It's not, I like to think of these um, behaviors as cortical reflexes, in a sense. Yeah? Uh, so, you know, your, your hand is burning. First, you take away the hand, or, or rather, first the hand moves away from uh, the fire, and then you realize what's going on. It would be completely maladaptive uh, for, the, uh, for this to happen in the other direction. You know, Ooh, my hand is burning, maybe I should you know, take it out. Um, and so in a way, what this shows is that you can be sufficiently expert uh, with years and years of practice, 10,000 hours, they say, at performing a particular uh, skill, that this becomes like a reflex uh, in that awareness now seems to come after the fact. Yeah. But, but I think you didn't address one of his points, if I understood it correctly, yeah. which was when you are immersed in that, it, 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 it's not necessarily that it frees you up to no, no, you know, start doing yeah. mental arithmetic or wh whatever it is, because you know, if you <laughs> You know, are a downhill skier and are at the, in, in the at the limit of you know crashing, which is what takes what it takes to win the race. You are totally in the moment, but it's not like that. You start thinking about dinner. The minute that you start thinking about dinner, you crashed. Yeah. Uh, so I think, but there's a distinction there. I think between attention and consciousness. So right. what 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 needs to be the case is that your attention be entirely focused on the execution of the skill, which requires you to stay focused on the skill. Um, and uh, so maybe but, that, yeah. no, that, that, that's just the opposite. Your, I would say your attention is totally unfocused on the execution of the skill. It's it's a receptive rather than an active attention. I understand? Yeah. And uh -huh. you're you're conscious of the situation, but so maybe you're not what... attending to what you're doing within the situation. Yeah. See, it seems to me this kind of levels of attention, if you will, that you've got the. Mm -hmm the sort of complete switch off when you're doing something relatively simple, I suppose, where you can think of something completely other without it affecting too much. But something like where you are perhaps driving a car or a champion fencing person, 
if you suddenly switch off and start thinking, as you said, what are you going to have for dinner, you've lost it. So you're not attending to every action within it, but you're attending to the whole performance of it. I don't know about this outside and inside stuff, observing, but I think sort of levels comes closer for me. But there's also degrees, though, because you can perfectly have a uh, conversation or think of something else while driving, for instance, because this is a skill that isn't, after all, this complicated. Uh, you cannot do that while performing something that is extremely difficult and extremely complex, like fencing an opponent, yeah? Or unless you're driving a Formula One. Yeah, yeah of course, <laughs> exactly. precisely, yeah. But if you're drive, you know, happily driving <laughs> around, yeah, you, you can dedicate some, some attention to our stuff. Yeah. The same applies to elephants, by the way. Hi, uh, Maxwell Ramstead, uh, U Montreal. Uh, my, my question is for uh, Professor Clearmans. I was wondering if uh, you think your, your approach uh, does anything to address the question of felt experience. Uh, I, I hate to bring it back to the hard problem, uh, but uh, I, do you think that the, the approach you're adopting takes us uh, yeah, anywhere near explaining how perhaps uh, these experiences or th this awareness could be felt as opposed to just uh, be structured in a metacognitive architecture? Or? He's multitasking. That wasn't, oh, was that for me? Sorry. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was reading the uh, Twitter feed. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. Oh, there's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I assumed it was for you. I was saying, I hate to bring it back to the hard problem, but do, do you think that the, uh, the cognitive architectures you're proposing do anything to explain the felt quality of, uh, of the representations in question? or uh... The felt quality of yeah. the representations. Well, I mean, this is extremely difficult. Uh, I, don't have a, I don't really have a good answer, uh, except what I said in this presentation, which was that uh, the felt quality of um, uh, a representation consists of all the affective and uh, uh, cognitive associations that have accrued with that particular representation as a result of your experience with, uh, with life. And so it seems to me that what defines both the felt qualities as well as the uh, personal uh, character of any experience is, is consists of that. And w once you have unraveled or uh, completely described that associative network, then that's it. That's, that's what the experience consists of for you. Uh, so there's no further magical ingredient uh, at that point. Uh, some people would like to think that there is. And it's true that this doesn't completely seem to account for what it means to have an experience. But I cannot really think of anything else, you know? So, um, so yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, that and then the, um, the argument of Humphreys, which I also find, uh, find it intriguing and interesting, that is this, this idea that what, um, what a perception consists of is uh, subsumed or at least is connected with the motor commands that would be required to elicit that particular uh, perception. Uh, so this internalization of action. Yeah? Uh, it's an intri intriguing proposal as well. Um, I have a question for, oh, my name is Carrie Hoff from McGill. I have a question for Dr. Pessoa. Um, two things. Um, one thing I was wondering about is when you pair a certain stimuli um, with, like a neutral stimuli with uh, shock, like however mild it is, and then you were kind of inferring that, that um, the, the emotional valence of that stimuli was affecting how um, we have activation in V1 and V2 and so on. Um, I was wondering what kind of experiments were done to uh, rule out whether that shock just makes that stimuli create, um, induce more attention. So even if you rule out the trials where the shock was actually given, maybe the, the person just learned to pay more attention when that stimuli came on as opposed to the emotional component of it. And another point was um, you found some individual differences um, in some, stu uh, some subjects saw the masked stimuli, uh, even though the, 
the stimuli, um, the timing was very short. I wondered uh, what was the mechanism for that type of kind of super vision. <laughs> oh, okay, so I, I think the first point is that I, I don't think it's very useful to make a, dis, a distinction between, to basically try to exclude attention in itself because I think it's actually a mechanism by which attention operates. It's just not the typical attentional type of you know, textbook description of attention in which parietal cortex or frontal cortex does something. But I do think it's, it is a type of, of, of attention. Um, I, I think that some of the details and we can discuss later maybe and you can also take a look at, at, at the, um, the paper in which we, we try to rule out some kind of generalized arousal effect and so that is actually possible and that was a, a big concern of ours that was just people getting aroused and that's what it, what it was so I think we have um, uh, th there's some control conditions in which we look at that and rule out that possibility so arousal concerns me but attention itself I, I view that as one mechanism of attention the other the other question that you had is is how could they how could some subjects um, have better than chance performance at 17 millisecond condition. Uh, we found, uh, I don't think this has been ever um, thoroughly investigated to, to the best of my knowledge, but we found subjects that could not detect 60 or 70 millisecond targets. So it's very slow. Most of us will detect it very easily. But we also found subjects that can detect it very, very quickly, very uh, short presentations. So we found a large amount of individual differences. And when I was, this work is, I'm not pursuing this work as much nowadays, but when I used to, to, to describe this work to people, people would like, well, what, it, what is it that these people differ on? And, and it would be really interesting to pursue that question, but I, I, I have very little clues. And one of them is that in one of our studies, we collected individual measures of uh, trait and state anxiety, and individuals that self-reported being more anxious in general had a trend, you know, it basically correlated with their ability to detect uh, the shorter stimuli. But it was really a very small group, and I would in no way be confident unless I, I would replicate that result. Yeah. Okay, I think I'll We'll have time for one last question, please. So I guess uh, my, my, I have two questions, if there's enough time, ah. or maybe just one. Okay. Uh, so the, the two first questions? Okay. is for Dr. Pissot. It's an extension of the, the previous oh, no. question. So then it's two questions, please. <laughs> so uh, in, um, you, you must know the human brain is very lateralized. Most of us have our speech areas on the left. And there are these uh, famous experiments where if you block the view and you show a word either to the left eye or to the right eye, if you show, most people have our speech areas on the left, so if you show a word to the right area, the person can tell you they saw the word and what the word is, but if you show the word only to the left eye, the person cannot tell you that they saw it. They'll say that they didn't see a word if somebody has a, a split brain surgery, right? So um, I noticed um, you showed the bold signal for uh, two individuals, one who had detected the stimulus and one who had not. And uh, the one who had detected, it looked like there was bilateral activation of the amygdala, and the one who had not detected, there was unilateral um, activation. I wonder if you've looked at effects of lateral. Yeah, those, I, I failed to mention it. it. Those are group results. And I mean, I mean I've done experiments targeting the amygdala as well as other brain regions for a while and I don't have a good sense of laterality there and, and sometimes people ask me and I, I mean the amygdala is a really tricky image uh, region to image and all sorts of signal distortion and whatnot and I, I, I think that uh, many times when you when you lower the threshold you see both sides and it's it's hard for me to be, have more of a conclusion but in that case it wasn't an individual it was actually the group and I, but I don't have a good explanation or interpretation of, of maybe that maybe look if it's left or right side Matt that Curry. that one that no actually that one was uh it was left sided okay that was the left side and, and your second question was is there is there time yeah, yeah the second ahead, yeah. question was for Dr. Clearman so I was I was struck by uh, your recipe for global workspace, right? Um, which really looks like what we know about cortical connectivity, 
right? Um, it's a small world network where you have, you know, most things which are close by, connected, and then there's, you know, long distance connections. And um, so what we know about sensory encoding um, is, you know, at the, the fundamental stages of processing, you have very uh, simple stimulus features. The cells are very uh, responsive, responsive to simple stimulus features, whereas uh, the further you get away from, the later you are in the encoding, the more abstract or the more complex the cell's responses are. And, and I'm trying to imagine this um, in terms of your redescription, and, and I'm having a hard time really fitting it all together, and I'm wondering if you have anything to say in terms of the neural, neural substrates. Um, uh, I'm not so sure exactly what the question is about, but um, basically, yes, there's many sensory pathways that involve multiple layers of redescriptions. Uh, I mean, the, the one example that everybody uses is the visual cortex where this organization has been uh, abundantly uh, documented. I, I um, guess the question is, is the redescription a product of those, the, the reverse driving um, stimuli? I mean, is so, reverse driving the stimuli. So, uh, so you go from V1 to V2, V2, V3, but V3 drives V2 as well as V2 drives V3. And is that, is that what you're thinking of as uh, redescription? No. Um, and in a sense, yes. So, I mean, it, it, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's late and I'm jet lagged. Right? So, so, um, but uh, as I was for, uh, describing in answer to another question, I think there's different kinds of redescriptions. Uh, one of them is indeed a sort of within pathway redescription, which is ex exactly perhaps what we have in the visual cortex. And this doesn't preclude uh, recurrent connections at that point as well. So as you say, later uh, areas can drive input uh, to, the, uh, to the earlier area, uh, areas and, and likewise contain a form of predictive coding. That's exactly what a number of authors are now proposing uh, that, um, well, this in instantiates uh, uh, predictive feedback, really. Um, the meta-representations, as I have described them, are assumed to be sitting outside of these, feed for, uh, the, these first order chains um, in a way that I try to capture by, in this image of uh, how to build a global workspace. You know, so you have a, a feed-forward layer, and then on the side of it is another system the, the, the task of which is to re-describe, in some sense, the activity of that first order uh, chain. Now, it gets very hairy very quickly because, of course, you also want to have the possibility for that higher level independent redescription to influence in some way uh, what is going on in the first order chain, and not merely, <clears throat> as in the simulations that I've very briefly described, read out of uh, the state of that first order pathway. And indeed, in the cognitive control computational literature, there are insta uh, examples of that, uh, of systems that uh, are actually able to monitor, say, the conflict at the level of response units uh, in a simple connectionist uh, network like that, and influence, in turn, uh, what happens in one of several competing first-order pathways so as to correct the conflict, for instance. But, you know, and in the... Um, Meta-representational uh, literature, or at least in the uh, sort of signal detection literature, in the recent literature, there's been discussions of, um, um, about the question of finding out whether the relationships between first order performance and second order performance is one that involves independent systems, basically. So there's one system doing the confidence uh, stuff and one system actually performing the task, as I've described it, or whether it involves um, uh, systems that are organized hierarchically. Mm -hmm. So these are very, you know, complicated questions that no one at this point has a, a sort of good answer to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, before we finish this, um, Professor Harnold has an announcement for you. Okay, I have some good news and some bad news. Which one do you want first? <laughs> bad news. Okay, the bad news is that, uh, well, let, no, I'm going to give you the good news anyway. You can, you, you, can, you can sleep a little bit longer tomorrow morning because Professor Mancuso has a health problem in his family. I actually knew this a couple of days ago, but I also honestly ceased to become conscious of it because I was so busy um, treating all of the commentaries, I forgot that I had re replied to him that I was 
of course, very sorry for what happened, and I asked him if he could make a video the way Dr. Bars did, and then I just put it out of my mind, and now I see we're very close to tomorrow, and I have no video, but I do have a video. So what we're going to do, for those of you who want to get up anyway, tomorrow morning, uh, we're going to show the TED video, but of course, you could also watch it at home on your, uh, on your, um, on your uh, computers. There, he has a very um, exciting 15-minute TED video about intelligence and plants, and if you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing it. So that will be shown at what time? Sh we'll show it first thing in the morning at 9, and then, and then uh, we'll, we'll have some coffee until the second speaker. Maybe what? Uh, okay, fine. Uh, yeah, but people won't know. People are going to show up. Not everybody's here. Okay, I won't show it at 9. I'll show it at 9.20. <laughs> okay, that's it? That's it. Well, thank you, everybody.